Section 7 of Cakes and Ale. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Annie Rue. Cakes and Ale by Edward Spencer. Section 7. Dinner Continued. It is the cause. Now for the cause, alluded to at the end of the last chapter. Imprimis. The French invasion is due to the universal craze for imitation, which may be the sincerest form of flattery, but which frequently leads to bad results. For years past, the fair sex of Great Britain have been looking to Paris for fashion in dress, as well as in cookery, whilst the other sex, having long held the mistaken notion that they manage things better in France, the idea that France is the only country capable of clothing the outer and the inner man, artistically, has taken deep root. Thus, if the Duchess of Dulverton import, regardless of expense, a divine creation in bonnets from the Rue de Castiglione, and air the same in church, it is good odds that little Mrs. Stokes of the Talbot Road Bayswater will have the chapeau copied at about one-twentieth of the original cost by the next Sabbath day. Dear Lady Thistlebrain, who has such taste, since she quitted the family mangle in the little Toke Street, Lambeth, for two mansions, a castle, and a deer park, and with whom money is no object, pays her chef the wages of an ambassador, and everybody raves over her dinners. Mrs. Potter of Maida Vale sets her gal, who studied higher gastronomy together with the piano and flower painting on satin at the board school, to work similar menus, with, on the whole, disastrous results. The London Society and Fashion Journals encourage this snobbish idea by quoting menus, most of them ridiculous. Amongst the middle classes, the custom of giving dinner parties at hotels has for some time past been spreading, partly to save trouble, and partly to save the brain of the domestic cook, so that instead of sitting down to a plain dinner with maybe an entree or two set in by the local confectioner around the family mahogany tree, all may be fanciful decoration and not half enough to eat, electric light and a la with attendants charged in the bill. The only way to stop this sort of thing is to bring the system into ridicule, to try it on the groundlings. A fair leader of the ton, late in the sixties, appeared one morning in the haunts of fashion, her shapely shoulders covered with a cape of finest Russian sables, to the general admiration and envy of all her compeers. Thereupon, what did her dearest friend, and of course most deadly rival, do? Get a similar cape, or one of finer quality? not a bit of it. She drove off then and there to her furriers, and had her coachman and footman fitted with a similar cape in, of course, cheaper material, and when the next afternoon she took the air in the park in her perfectly appointed landau, her fur-clad menials created something like a panic in the camp of her enemy, whilst fur capes for fair leaders of ton were like hashed venison at a city luncheon, very soon hoff. It is extremely probable that could it be arranged to feast our workhouse children on bisque de creveze and ananas a la creole, the upper classes of Great Britain would soon revert to plain roast and boiled. It is extremely probable that could it be arranged to feed our starving poor beneath the public gaze on sole normande, colette a la reforme, and salami de gibier truffé, to feast our workhouse children on bisque de crivesse and ananas a la creole, the upper classes of Great Britain would soon revert to plain roast and boiled. But after all, it is the English caterer who is chiefly to blame for his own undoing. How is it that in what may be called the food streets of the metropolis, the foreign food supplier should outnumber the purveyor of the roast beef of old England in the proportion of fifty to one? simply because the roast beef of old england has become almost as extinct as the dodo there are but few english kitchens at this end of the nineteenth century in which meat is roasted in front of the fire 
in order to save the cost of fuel most english save the mark cooking is now performed by gas or steam and at many large establishments the food whether fish flesh fowl vegetables or pastry all goes in raw state into the species of chest of drawers made of block tin in which receptacle the daily luncheons dinners and suppers are steamed and robbed of all flavor save that of the hot tin the pity of it better far better for mankind the Allah system than to be gradually steamed into the tomb it is alleged that as good results in the way of roasting can be got from an oven as from the spit but that oven must be ventilated with both an inlet and an outlet ventilator for one will not act without the other it is also advisable that said oven should be cleaned out occasionally for a hot oven with no joint therein will emit odors anything but agreeable if not attended to and it is not too sweeping a statement to say that the majority of ovens in busy kitchens are foul the system of steaming food the alleged roasts being subsequently browned in an oven is of comparatively recent date but the oven as a roaster was the invention of one count rumford at the beginning of the nineteenth century in one of his lectures on oven roasting this nobleman remarked that he despaired of getting any englishman to believe his words so that he was evidently confronted with plenty of prejudice which is devoutly to be prayed still exists in english homes for i do vow and protest that the ovened odours which pervade the neighbourhoods of the strand london at midday are by no means calculated to whet the appetite of the would-be luncher or diner this is what such authority as mr buckmaster wrote on the subject of the spit versus the oven i am believed i am regarded as a sort of heretic on the question of roasting meat my opinion is that the essential condition of good roasting is constant basting and this meat is not likely to have then been shut up in an iron box and what is not easily done is easily neglected in this connection there are more heretics than mr buckmaster but if during my lifetime the days of burning heretics should be revived i shall certainly move to the court of criminal appeal in favor of being roasted or grilled before or over the fire instead of being deprived by my natural juices in an iron box some few roast houses are still in existence in london but they be few and far between and since mr cooper gave up the albion nearly opposite the stage door of drury lane theatre the lover of good wholesome english food has lost one old-fashioned tavern in the which was certain of enjoying food the lover of good wholesome english food has lost one old-fashioned tavern in the which he was certain of enjoying such food it has been repeatedly urged in favour of french cookery that it is so economical but economy in the preparation of food is by no means an unmixed blessing i do not believe that much sole leather is used up in the ordinary ragout or salami but many of us who can afford more expensive joints have a prejudice against scrags whilst the tails of mutton chops frequently have a tainted flavor and the drumsticks and backs of fowls are only fit to grill or boil down into gravy and it is not only the alien who is economical in his preparation of the banquet many of the dwellers in the highways and byways of our great metropolis will boil down the outer skin of a ham and place a portion thereof together with such scraps as may be purchased at a penny or twopence a plateful at the ham and beef emporium with maybe a block ornament or two from the butchers in a pie dish with a superstructure of potatoes and have a scrap pie cooked at the baker's for the sunday dinner poor wretches not much waste goes on in such households but i have known the gal who tortured the food in a cheap lodging-house throw away the water in which the joint had just been boiled but whether this was from sheer ignorance or cussedness or the desire to save herself any future labor in the concoction of soup to ponneth say it not by the way it is in the matter of soup that the tastes of british and french peasantry differ so materially unless he or she be absolutely starving it is next to impossible to get one of the groundlings of old england to attempt a basin of soup and when they do attempt the same it has already been made for them the scotch who are born cooks know much better than this but do not o oh reader if at all thin of skin or refined of ear listen too attentively to the thanks which a denizen of the 
distressful countries will bestow upon you for a thirty bowl of bone juice how many modern diners we wonder know the original object of placing frills around the shank of a leg or shoulder of mutton a ham the shins of a fowl or the bone of a cutlet fingers were made before and a long time before forks in the seventeenth century prior to which epoch not much nicety was observed in carving or eating we read that english gentlewomen were instructed by schoolmistresses and professors of etiquette as to the ways in which it behooved them to carve joints that she might be able to grasp a roasted chicken without greasing her left hand the gentle housewife was careful to trim its foot and the lower part of its legs with cut paper the paper frill which may still be seen around the bony point and some small end of a leg of mutton is a memorial of the fashion in which joints were dressed for the dainty hands of lady carvers in time prior to the introduction of the carving fork an implement that was not in universal use so late as the commonwealth how long should we sit over a dinner table is a matter of controversy at the commencement of the nineteenth century the hard drinking times our forefathers were loath indeed to quit the table but the fairer portion of the guests were accustomed to adjourn early for tea and scandal in the withdrawing-room while their lords sat and quarrelled over their port with locked doors and where they fell there they frequently passed the night the editor of the almanac des gourmandes wrote five hours at a table are reasonable latitude to allow in the case of a large party and recondite cheer but the worthy grimaud de la gramiere the editor aforesaid lived at a period when dinner was not served as late as eight thirty p m there is a legend of an archbishop of york who sat three entire years at dinner but this is one of those tales which specially suited the dull brandy-sodden brains of our ancestors the facts are simply as follows the archbishop had just sat down to dinner at noon when an italian priest called hearing that the dignitary was sitting at meat the priest whiled away an hour in looking at the minister and called again but was again repelled by the porter twice more that afternoon did the surly porter repel the italian and at the fourth visit the porter in a heat answered never a word and churlishly did shuttle the gates upon him then the discomfited italian returned to rome and three years later encountering an englishman in the eternal city who declared himself right well to know his grace of york the italian all smiles inquired i pray you good sir hath the archbishop finished dinner yet hence the story which was doubtless originally told by a fly fisher it is not a little singular that with increasing civilization which is of barbaric or semi-barbaric origin should be the means usually employed to summon us to the dinner-table in days of yore the horn or cornet was blown as the signal alexander dumas tells us that at the period when noon was the dinner hour the horn or cornet le cour was used in great houses to announce dinner hence came an expression which has been lost they used to say cornet or trumpet the dinner cornet le dîner and we were asked to believe that to this practice corned beef owns its derivation in days when inferior people ate little meat in the winter months save salted beef the more usual form of the order was cornet le boeuf corn the beef richardson errs egregiously when he insists that corned beef derived its distinguishing epithet from the grains of corn or salt with which it was pickled corned beef is trumpeted beef or as we should nowadays say dinner bell beef well i hae me doots as the scotsman said i'm not so sure that richardson erred egregiously but after all as long as the beef be good and can be carved without the aid of pick and spade what does it matter let us to dinner end of section seven Section 8 of Cakes and Ale. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Cakes and Ale by Edward Spencer. Section 8. Dinner. Continued. The strong table groans beneath the smoking sirloin stretched immense. A Christmas dinner in the early Victorian era. Quel fate magnifique! 
the man who did not keep Christmas in a fitting manner in those days was not thought much of. Dines by himself at the club on Christmas Day was the way the late Mr. George Payne of sporting memory summed up a certain middle-aged recluse, with heaps of money, who, although he had two estates in the country, preferred to live in two small rooms in St. James Place, southwest, and to take his meals at Arthur's. And how we boys, not to mention the little lasses in white frocks and black mittens, used to overeat ourselves on such occasions, with no fear of pill, draught, or staying in before our eyes. The writer has in his mind's eye a good specimen of such an old-fashioned dinner as served in the fifties. It was pretty much the same feast every Christmas. We commenced with some sort of clear soup with meat in it. Then came a codfish, crimped. The head of that household would have as soon thought of eating a sole au min blanc as of putting before his family an uncrimped cod, with plenty of liver, oyster sauce, and pickled walnuts. And at the other end of the table was a dish of fried smelts. Entrees? Had any of the diners asked for an entree, his or her exit from the room would have been a somewhat rapid one. A noble sirloin of Scotch beef faced a boiled turkey anointed with celery sauce. And then appeared the blazing pudding and the mince pies. For the next course, a dish of toasted, or rather stewed, cheese, home-made and full of richness, was handed round, with dry toast, the bearer of which was closely pursued by a varlet, carrying a huge double-handed vessel of hot-spiced ale, bobbing or floating about in the which were roasted crab-apples and sippets of toast. And it was de rigueur for each of those who sat at meat to extract a sippet to eat with the cheese. How the old retainer, grey and plethoric with service, loved us boys, and how he would manoeuvre to obtain for us the tidbits. A favoured servitor was Joseph, and though my revered progenitor was ostensibly the head of the house, he would, on occasion, run a bad second to Joseph. Memory is still keen of a certain chilly evening in September when the ladies had retired to the drawing-room, and the male guests were invited to be seated at the small table which had been wheeled close to the replenished fire. Joseph, said the dear old man, bring us a bottle or two of the yellow seal. You know, Ben F. The servitor drew near to his master, and in a stage whisper exclaimed, You can't afford it, sir. What's that? roared the indignant old man. You can't afford it, sir. Hawthornden's won the ledger. Good gad! A pause, and then, Well, never mind, Joseph, we'll have up the yellow seal all the same. One of the writer's last Christmas dinners was partaken of in a sweet little house in Mayfair, and affords somewhat of a contrast with the meal quoted above. We took our appetites away with a salad composed of anchovies, capers, truffles, and other things, a Russian sardine or two, and rolls and butter. Thence we drifted into bouillabaisse, a tasty but bile-provoking broth, toyed with some fillets de sole à la Parisienne, good but greasy and disposed of a tornado's with a nice fat oyster atop a piece. A parlez-moi de ça. Then came some dicky birds sur canapé, alleged to be snipe, but destitute of flavor save that of the tin they had been spoiled in, and of the canopy. An alien cook cannot cook game, whatever choice confections he may turn out. At least that is the experience of the writer. We had cressons, of course, with the birds, though how watercress can possibly assimilate with the flesh of a snipe is questionable. Watercreases are all very well at tea in the arbor, but don't go smoothly with any sort of fowl, and to put such rank stuff into a salad, as my hostess's cook did, is absolutely criminal. To continue the Mayfair banquet, the salad was followed by a souffle à la Noël, which reminded some of the more imaginative of our party of the festive season, some cheese straws, and the customary ices, coffee, and liqueurs. On the whole, not a bad meal. But what would old Father Christmas have said thereto? What would my revered progenitor have remarked, had he been allowed to revisit the glimpses of the moon? He did not love our lively neighbors, and upon the only occasion on which he was inveigled across the channel, took a special care to recross it the very next day, 
lest through circumstances not under his own control he might come to be buried amongst these deed French. The following menu may give some idea as to how royalty entertains its guests. Said menu, as will be seen, is comparatively simple, and many of the dishes are French only in name. Itra Consommé aux oeufs pochés Bisque de crevici Turbot, sauce d'omard Filets de salmon à la indienne Bolivon financier Mauviers sur le nid Cilet du mouton de gaies roitier Goulards à la estragon Faisan Becassine sur croûte Chauffleur au gratin, plum pudding, beverois à abricots, glacé à la mocha. Truly a pattern dinner, this, and twould be sure impertinence to comment thereon, beyond remarking that English dishes should, in common fairness, be called by English names. Her Imperial Majesty the Tsaritsa, on the night of her arrival at Darmstadt, in October 1896, sat down together with her august husband to the following simple meal consommé de volalille cronstades de acrevises filet de turbot à la joinville simier de chevriule a haunch of roebuck is far to be desired above the same quarter of the red deer tureen de perdreau panche royal poulard de metz choux de brazil Beverot à abricots, glaces panachés. The partiality of crowned heads towards Beverot à abricots. Beverot is simply Bavarian cheese, a superior sort of blancmange is proverbial. And the above repast was served on priceless mice in China and silver. The only remarks I will make upon the above menu are that it is quite possible that the capon may have come from Metz, although not very probable. French cooks name their meat and poultry in the most reckless fashion. For instance, owing to this reckless nomenclature, the belief has grown that the best ducks come from Rouen. Nothing of the sort. There are just as good ducks raised at West Hartlepool as at Rouen. Rouen, in the bill of fare, is simply a corruption of Rhone, and a Rhone duck is a quacker who has assumed, through crossing, the reddish plumage of the wild bird. As for alleged Surrey fowls, most of them come from Heathfield in Sussex, whence one hundred forty two thousand pounds worth were sent in eighteen ninety six. Let us inquire into the composition of some of the high sounding plats served up by the average chef. Bouillabaisse. Of it Thackeray sang this bouillabaisse, a noble dish is, a sort of soup, or broth, or brew or hotchpot of all sorts of fishes that Greenwich never could outdo. Green herbs, red peppers, mussels, saffron, soles, onions, garlic, roach, and dace. All these you eat at Terror's Tavern, in that one dish of bouillabaisse. Avoid eels and herrings in this concoction is too oily. Soles, mullet, John Dory, whiting, flounders, perch, roach, and mussels will blend well and allow half a pound of fish for each person. For every pound of fish put in the stew pan a pint of water, a quarter of a pint of white wine, and a tablespoonful of salad oil. If there be four partakers, add two sliced onions, two cloves, two bay leaves, two leeks, the white part only, chopped, four cloves of garlic, a tablespoonful chopped parsley, a good squeeze of lemon juice, half an ounce of chopped capiscums, a teaspoonful or more ad lib of saffron, with pepper and salt. Mix the chopped fish in all this and boil for half an hour. Let the mixture gallop, and strain into a tureen with sippets, and the fish served separately. Tornadoes. No relation to tornado, and you won't find the word in any Gallic dictionary. A tornadoes is a thin collop of beef, steeped in a marinade for twenty-four hours. Personally, I prefer it without the aid of the marine, and fried lightly. Turn it but once. The oyster atop is simply scalded. Try this dish. Bisque. 
In the seventeenth century this was made from pigeons by the poor barbarians who knew not the gentle lobster, nor the confiding crayfish. Heat up to boiling point a mirapo of white wine. You don't know what a mirapo is? Simply a faggot of vegetables, named after a notorious cuckold of noble birth in the time of Louis the Fifteenth. Two carrots, two onions, two shallots, two bay leaves, a sprig of thyme, and a clove of garlic. Mince very small with half a pound of fat bacon, half a pound of raw ham, pepper and salt, and a little butter. Add a sufficiency of white wine. In this mixture cook two dozen crayfish for twenty minutes, continually tossing them about till red, when take them out to cool. Shell them all but the claws, which should be pounded in a mortar and mixed with butter. The flesh of the tails is reserved to be put in the soup at the last minute. The body flesh goes back into the mirapo, to which two quarts of broth are now added. Add the pounded shells to the soup, simmer for an hour and a half, strain, heat up, add a piece of butter, the tails, a seasoning of cayenne, and a few quenelles of whiting. Volavant financier. This always reminds me of the fearful threat hurled by the waiter in the bab ballads at his flighty sweetheart. Flirte toujours, ma belle, si tu oses. Je me vengerai en zai, ma chère. Je lui dirai de quoi en commose. Volavant à la financière. Make your crust light as air and flaky as snow, and you value your situation, and fill with button mushrooms, truffles, coxcombs, quenelles of chicken, and sweetbread, all chopped, seasoned, and moistened with a butter sauce. Brown gravy is objectionable. Garnish the vol with fried parsley, which goes well with most luxuries of this sort. There are some words which occur frequently in French cookery which, to the ordinary perfidious Briton, are cruelly misleading. For years I was under the impression that Briat Savarine was a species of filleted fish, brill, in a rich gravy, instead of a French magistrate who treated gastronomy poetically and always ate his food too fast. And only within the last decade have I discovered what a prié salé really means. Literally it is a salt meadow or marsh. It is said that sheep fed on a salt marsh make excellent mutton. But is it not about time for Britannia, the alleged pride of the ocean, and ruler of its billows, to put her foot down in protest against a leg of prime down, but recently landed from the antipodes, being described on the card as a Guijot de Prié Salé? The meals, like the ways of the heathen Chinese, are peculiar. Some of his food, to quote poor corny grain, is absolutely beastly. Lee Hung Chong was welcomed to Carlton House Terrace, London, with a dinner in twelve courses, the following being the principal items. Roast duck, roast pork and raspberry jam, followed by dressed cucumber. Shrimps were devoured, armor and all, with leeks, gherkins, and mushrooms. A couple of young chickens preserved in wine and vinegar with green peas, a puree of pigeon's legs followed by an assortment of sour jellies. The banquet concluded with sponge cakes and tea. In his own land, the Chinaman's evening repast is much more variegated than the above. It is almost as long as a Chinese drama. It includes melon seeds, bitter almonds, bamboo sprouts, jellyfish, cucumber, roast duck, chicken stewed in spring dregs. Footnote. This dish must somewhat resemble the fixed bayonet, which at one time was the favorite tidbit of Tommy Adkins, when quartered in India. It consisted of a fowl stuffed with green chilies and boiled in rum. The fowl was picked to the bones, and the soldier wound up with the soup. Very tasty. End footnote. Peas, prawns, sausages, scallions, fish brawn, pork chops, plum blossoms, oranges, bird's nest soup, pigeon eggs and bean curd, the eggs being postponed ones, fungus, shrimps, macerated fish fins, ham in flour, ham in honey, turnip cakes, roast sucking pig, fish maws, roast mutton, wild duck's feet, water chestnuts, egg rolls, lily seeds, stewed mushrooms, dressed crab with jam, chrysanthemum pasties, 
beige de mer in pig's feet in honey, can it be wondered at that this nation should have been brought to its knees by gallant little Japan? The Englishman in China has not a particularly good time of it in the gastronomic way, and Her Majesty's forces in Hong Kong are largely dependent on Shanghai for supplies. There is plenty pig all over the land, but the dairy-fed pork of old England is preferable, and the way this little pig goes to market savors so strongly of the most refined cruelty that a branch of the RSPCA would have the busiest of times of it over yonder. Reverting to French cookery, here is an appetizing dish, called a Bernardine Salmi. It should be prepared in the dining room before the eyes of the guests, and Grimaud de la Reynier, to whom the recipe was given by the prior of an abbey of Bernardine monks, recommends that the Salmi should be conveyed to the mouth with a fork, for fear of devouring one's fingers should they touch the sauce. Take three woodcocks underdone, and cut them into neat portions. On a silver dish bruise the livers and trails, squeeze over them the juice of four lemons, and grate over them a little of the thin rind. Add the portions of woodcock seasoned with salt, and according to the prior, mixed spices and two teaspoonfuls of French mustard, but the writer would substitute cayenne sole. Over all half a wine glass of sherry, and then put the dish over a spirit lamp. When the mixture is nearly boiling, add a tablespoonful of salad oil, blow out the light, and stir well. Four lemons are mentioned in this recipe, as at the time it was written lemons were very small, one cocks were in. Two imported lemons or limes will amply suffice nowadays. A salmi of wild duck can be made almost in the same way, but here the aid of that modern instrument, the duck squeezer, is necessary. Cut the best of the meat in slices off a lightly roasted wild duck, after brought to table. Break up the carcass and place in a species of mill, silver, called a duck squeezer, which possesses a spout through which the richness of the animal escapes after being squeezed. Make a gravy of this liquor, in a silver dish with a spirit lamp beneath, added to a small pat of butter, the juice of a lemon, a tablespoonful of Worcester sauce, with cayenne and salt to taste, and half a wine-glassful of port wine. Warm the meat through in this gravy, which must not boil. Of course, these last two named dishes are only intended for bachelor parties. Lovely women must not be kept waiting for duck squeezers or anything else. The Jesuits introduced the turkey into Europe, of which feet the Jesuits need not boast too much for to some minds there be many better edible birds, and the gobbler requires, when roasted or boiled, plenty of seasoning to make him palatable. The French stuff him in his roasted state with truffles, fat forcemeat or chestnuts, and invariably bard the bird. Bard is an old English as well as old French with fat bacon. The French turkey is also frequently braised with an abundant mirepoix made with what their cooks call madeira, but which is really Marsala. It is only we English who boil the gobbler and stuff him, or her, for it is the hen which usually goes into the pot, with oysters or force meat, with celery sauce. Probably the best parts of the turkey are his legs, when grilled for breakfast and smothered with the sauce mentioned in one of the chapters on breakfast. And pulled turkey makes an agreeable luncheon dish, or entree at dinner, the breast meat being pulled off the bone with a fork and fricasseed, surrounded in the dish by the grilled thighs and pinions. Who introduced the turkey into America, deponent saith not. Probably like Topsy, it growed there. Anyhow, the bird is so familiar a table companion in the States that Americans, when on tour in Europe, fight very shy of him. Tucky saw, cranberry sauce, used to be the stereotyped reply of the black waiter when interrogated on the subject of the bill of fare. Colored help is, however, gradually being ousted together with sulfur matches from the big hotels in New York, where white waiting and white food are coming into or have come into regular use. In fact, with the occasional addition of one or the other of such special dishes as terrapin, soft-shell crab, clam chowder, and the everlasting pork and beans, a dinner in New York differs very little at the time of writing, 1897, from one in London. The taste for clam chowder is an acquired one, 
nor will stewed tortoise ever rank with thick turtle in British estimation, although tis not the same tortoise which is used in London households to break the coals with. A canvas-backed duck, if eaten in the land of his birth, is decidedly the most delicately flavoured of all the quack family. His favourite food is said to be wild celery, and his favourite haunts the neighbourhood of Chesapeake Bay, from whose waters comes the much-prized diamond-backed terrapin, which is sold at the rate of fifty dollars or sixty dollars the dozen. The canvas-backed duck, however, suffers in transportation. In fact, the tendency of the ice-house aboard ship is to rob all food of its flavour. But however good be the living in New York City, where the hotels are the best in the world, and whose Mr. Delmonico can give points to all sorts and conditions of food caterers, it is a bit rough in the provinces. There is a story told of a young actor on tour who struck a small town out west and put up at a small inn. In course of time dinner was served and the landlord waited at table. The principal cover was removed, disclosing a fine joint of coarseous, indifferently cooked beef. Our young actor was strangely moved at the sight. What? he cried. Beef? Again? This is horrible. I've eaten no other food for months, and I'm sick and tired of it. I can't eat beef. Whereupon his host whipped out a huge six-shooter revolver, and covering the recalcitrant beef-eater, coolly remarked, Guess you can. But I don't believe that story any more than I believe the anecdote of the cowboys in the daylight let through the visitor who couldn't eat beans. End of section 8. Recording by Philip Gould. Section 9 of Cakes and Ale. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Cakes and Ale by Edward Spencer. Section 9. Dinner. Continued. The combat deepens. On, ye brave, the cordon bleu, and then the grave. Waved, landlord, all thy menus wave, and charge with all thy deviltry. What's in a name? inquired the lovesick Juliet. What? echoes the bad fairy. Allah? After all the fuss made by the French over their soups, we might expect more variety than is given us. If it be true that we English have only one sauce, it is equally true that our lively neighbors have only one soup, and that one is a broth. It is known to the frequenters of restaurants under at least eleven different names. Brunois, Jardinier, Printanière, Chiffonade, Macedoine, Julienne, Faubon, Paisanne, Flamande, Mitonnage, Cruité au pot, and as Sam Weller would say, it's the flavoring as does it. It is simply bouillon, plain broth and weak at that. The addition of a cabbage, or a leek, or a common or beggar's crust will change a potage à la jardinière into a cruité au pot, and vice versa. Great is à la, and five hundred percent is her profit. The amount of money lavished by diners about upon the production of the alien chef would be ludicrous to consider, were not the extravagance absolutely criminal. The writer has partaken of about the most expensive dinner, English for the most part, with French names to the dishes, that could be put on the table, the charge being, including wines, one guinea per mouth. Another banquet, given by a gay youth who had acquired a large sum through ruining somebody else on the stock exchange, the meal positively reeking of Allah, was charged for by the hotel manager at the rate of sixteen pounds per head, also including wines. I was told afterwards, though I am still sceptical as to the veracity of the statement, that the flowers on the table at that banquet cost alone more than seventy-five pounds. And only on the previous Sunday our host's father, a just nobleman and a God-fearing, had delivered a lecture at a popular institution on thrift. Here follows the menu of the above-mentioned guinea meal. A regimental dinner, held at a well-known city-house. Vin, Madiere, Ponce Glacé, Schloss Johannesburg, Amontillado, Champagne, 
Piper Heidsick, 1844, Ball at Sea, 1884, Burgundy Romani, 1855, Port, 1851, Claret, Chateau Leoville, Liqueurs, Hors d'oeuvres, Crivet, Ton Marine, Vare Radis, Potages, Torture Claire et Lie, Gras de Tortue Verte, Relevés de Tortue, Ailerons aux fines herbes, Cotelettes à la Perigot, Poissons, Sauchet de Salmon, Turbo à Vin Blanc, Blanchaille Nature et Cari, Entrees, Supreme de Riz de Vaux à la Princesse, Aspic de Omarg, Relevés, Venaison sauce grossier, York ham au champagne, Poulards à la Estragon, Asperges, Aricots verts, Pommes risoliers, Rote, Kenetones de Rouen, Entremans, Anans à la Creole, Patisserie Parisienne, Jellies panachés, Glacé, Souffle à fraises, Dessert, etc and some of the younger officers complained bitterly at having to pay one pound one shilling for the privilege of larking over such a course. There are only three faults I can find in the above program. 1. Confusion to the man who expects the British Army to swallow green fat in French. 2. White bait is far too delicately flavored a fowl to curry. 3. Too much eating and drinking. City dinners are for the most part an infliction, or affliction, on the diner. With more than fourscore sitting at meat, the miracle of the loaves and fishes is repeated, with, frequently, the fish left out. I give you my word, dear old chappie, once exclaimed a gilded youth who had been assisting at one of these functions, to the writer, all I could get hold of during the struggle was an orange and a cold plate. The great and powerful system of bakshis, of course, enters largely into these public entertainments, and the man who omits to fee the waiter in advance, as a rule, gets left. Bookmakers and others who go racing are the greatest sinners in this respect. A well-known magnet of the betting ring, 1896, invariably after arriving at an hotel, hunts up the chef and sheds upon him a fiver, or a tenner according to the size of the house, and the repute of its cookery and that metallician and his party are not likely to starve during their stay, whatever may be the fate of those who omit to remember the commissariat department. I have seen the same bookmakers carry with his own hands the remains of a great dish of hot-pot into the dining-room of his neighbors who had been ringing for a waiter and clamoring for food for the best part of an hour without effect. The same system prevails aboard ship, and the passenger who has not propitiated the head steward at the commencement of the voyage will not fare sumptuously. The steamship companies may deny this statement, but tis true, nevertheless. Dinner afloat. Here is an average dinner card during a life on the ocean wave. Julian soup, boiled salmon with shrimp sauce, roast beef and Yorkshire pudding, jugged hare, French beans a la maitre d'hotel, chicken curry, roast turkey with puree of chestnuts, fanchouettes, what are they? Sausage rolls, greengage tarts, plum puddings, lemon jellies, biscuits and cheese, fruit, coffee. Plenty of variety here, though some epicures might resent the presence of a sausage roll, the common or railway station bag of mystery on the dinner table. But since the carriage of livestock aboard passenger ships has been abandoned, the living is not nearly as good for, as before observed, the tendency of the ice-house is to make all flesh taste alike. Civilization has, doubtless, done wonders for us, but most people prefer mutton to have a flavor distinct from that of beef. My ideal dinner was partaken of in a little old-fashioned hostelry at the west end of London, whose name the concentrated efforts of all the wild horses in the world would not extract. Familiarity breeds contempt, and publicity oft kills that which is brought to light. Our host was a wine merchant in a large way of business. I can only promise you plain food, good sirs, he mentioned in advance. No foreign kickshaws, but everything done to a turn. Six of us started with clear turtle, followed by a thick wedge out of the middle of a patriarchal codfish with plenty of liver. 
and here a pause must be made, in not one cookery book known to mankind can be found a recipe for cooking the liver of a cod. Of course it should not be cooked with the fish, but in a separate vessel. The writer once went the rounds of the kitchens to obtain information on this point. About half an hour, said one cook, a hard-bitten looking food spoiler. Ma foi! I cook not at all the livers of the cod, said an unshorn son of Normandy. He is for the malade only. After asking a number of questions and a journey literally round the town, the deduction made from the various answers was that a piece of liver enough for six people would take eighteen minutes after being placed in boiling water. To continue with our dinner. No sauce with the oysters, but these simply scalded in their own liquor. Then came on a monster steak an inch thick, cut from the rump immediately before being placed on the gridiron. And here a word on the grilling of a steak. We English place it nearer the fire than do our lively neighbors, whose grills do not, in consequence, present that firm surface which is the charm of an English steak. The late Mr. Godfrey Turner of the Daily Telegraph, who was almost as great an authority as Mr. Salaw in gastronomies, once observed to the writer, Never turn your steak or chop more than once. Though by no means a disciple of Allah, he was evidently a believer in the French method of grilling, which leaves a sodden, flabby surface on the meat. The French cook only turns a steak once, but if he had his gridiron as close to the fire as his English rival, the chef would inevitably cremate his morceau de boeuf. I take it that in grilling, as in roasting, the meat should, in the first instance, almost touch the glowing embers. We had nothing but horseradish with our steak, which was succeeded by golden plovers, about the best bird that flies, and marrow bones, and a dig into a ripe stilton concluded a banquet which we would not have exchanged for the best efforts of Francatelli himself. Yes, Despite the efforts of the bad fairy Allah, the English method of cooking good food, if deftly and properly employed, is a long way the better method. Unfortunately, through the fault of the English themselves, this method is but seldom employed deftly or properly. And at a cheap English eating-house the kitchen is usually as dirty and malodorous as at an inexpensive foreign restaurant. As both invariably serve as sleeping apartments during the silent watches of the night, this is perhaps not altogether to be wondered at. But there is one plate in the French cookery book which is not to be sneered at or even condemned with faint praise. A properly dressed fricandeau is a dainty morsel indeed. In fact, the word fricand means in English dainty. Here is the recipe of the celebrated gouffet for the fricandeau. Three pounds of veal fillet, trimmed and larded with fat bacon. Put in the glazing stewpan the trimmings, two ounces of sliced carrot, two ditto onion, with pepper and salt. Lay the fricandeau on the top. Add half a pint of broth. Boil the broth till it is reduced and becomes thick and yellow. Add a pint and a half more broth, and simmer for an hour and a quarter, the stewpan half covered. Then close the stewpan and put live coals on the top. Baste the fricandeau with the gravy, presumably after the removal of the dead coals, every four minutes, till it is sufficiently glazed. Then take it out and place on a dish. Strain the gravy, skim off the fat, and pour over the meat. It may be added that a spirit lamp beneath the dish is, or should be, de rigueur. In their clubs, those alleged gilded saloons of profligacy and debauchery favored of the aristocracy, Men as a rule dine wisely and well, and moreover, cheaply. The extravagant diner out, with his crude views on the eternal fitness of things, selects an hotel or restaurant in the which, although the food may be of the worst quality and the cookery of the greasiest, the charges are certain to be on the millionaire scale, for bad dinners like bad lodgings are invariably the dearest. At the mess table of the British officer there is not much riot or extravagance nowadays and the food is but indifferently well cooked, though there was a time when the youngest cornet would turn up his nose at anything commoner than a special cuvee of champagne, and would unite with his fellows in the bear fight which invariably concluded a guest night, and during which the messman or one of his myrmidons was occasionally placed atop of the ante-room fire. And there was one messman who even preferred that mode of treatment to being lectured by his colonel. Said officer was starchy, punctilious, and long-winded, 
and upon one occasion when the chaplain of the garrison was his guest at dinner addressed the terrified servant somewhat after this wise mr messman i have this evening bidden to our feast this eminent divine who prayeth daily that we may receive the fruits of the earth in due season to which i an humble layman am in the habit of responding we beseech thee to hear us good lord mr messman don't let me see those deed figs on the table again at a military guest night in india a turkey and a europe ham are or were de rigueur at the table and on the whole the warrior fares well if the consumma do not attempt luxuries his chicken cutlets are not despicable and we can even forgive the repetition of the vela leaf but his beefsteak ishtu stewed steak is usually too highly spiced for the european palate later in the evening however he will come out strong with duvlebone and grilled sardines and curl papers the presence of the bagpipe in the mess-room of a highland regiment when men have well drunk is cruelly unkind to the saxon guest at all events the bagpipe is doubtless a melodious instrument to trained ears but its melodies are apt to hum in the head or muckle ye kin after a course of haggis washed down with sparkling wines and old port tell me what a man eats says brillet Savarin, and i'll tell you what he is peter the great did not like the presence of listening lackeys in the dining-room peter's favorite dinner was like himself peculiar a soup with four cabbages in it gruel pig with sour cream for sauce cold roast meat with pickled cucumbers or salad lemons and lamprey salt meat ham and limburg cheese lemons and lamprey must have had a roughish seat atop of pig and sour cream i once tasted lampreys only once it was in worcestershire and said lampreys were stewed i fancy in burgundy and served in a small tureen on casserole our lively neighbors would have called the production which was grateful but much embarrassed with richness napoleon the great whose tastes were simple is said to have preferred a broiled breast of mutton to any other dinner dish napoleon the third however encouraged extravagance of living and zola tells us in les debacles that the unfortunate emperor ill as he was used to sit down to so many courses of rich foods every night until the downfall arrived at sedan and that a train of cooks and scullions with literally a battery de cuisine was attached to his staff her majesty queen victoria's dinner-table is invariably graced with a cold sirloin of beef amongst other joints and the same simple fare has satisfied the aspirations and gratified the palate of full many a celebrity the great duke of wellington was partial to a well-made irish stew and nothing delighted charles dickens more than a slice out of the breast of a hot roast goose a word about the mushroom although said to be of enormous value in sauces and ragouts i shall always maintain that the mushroom is best when eaten all by his quaint self his flavor is so delicate that tis pitiful to mix him with fish flesh or fowl more especially the first name i have seen mushrooms and bacon cooked together and i have seen beefsteak cut into small pieces and bacon cooked together and it was with some difficulty that my irish host got me out of the kitchen if i ever am hanged it will be for killing a cook above all never eat mushrooms which you have not seen in their uncooked state the mushroom like the truffle loses more flavor the longer he is kept and to postpone either is fatal the plainer the meal the longer the life thus an eminent physician already mentioned in these pages we begin with soup and perhaps a glass of cold punch to be followed by a piece of turbo or a slice of salmon with lobster sauce and while the venison or south down is getting ready we toy with a piece of sweet bread and mellow it with a bumper of madeira no sooner is the mutton or venison disposed of with its never-failing accompaniments of jelly and vegetables than we set the whole of it in a ferment with champagne and drown it with hawk and sauterne these are quickly followed by the wing and breast of a partridge or bit of pheasant or wild duck and when the stomach is all on fire with excitement we cool it for an instant with a piece of iced pudding and then immediately lash it into a fury with undiluted alcohol in the form of cognac or a strong liqueur after which there comes a spoonful or so of jelly as an emollient a morsel of ripe stilton as a digestant a piquant salad to whet the appetite for wine and a glass of old port to persuade the stomach if it can into quietness all these are more leisurely succeeded by dessert with its baked meats its fruits its strong drinks to be afterwards muddled with coffee and complicated into a rare mixture with tea 
floating with the richest cream. Hoity-toity! And not a word about a French plate, or even a curry, either. But we must remember that this diatribe comes from a gentleman who has laid down the theory that cold water is not only the cheapest of beverages, but the best. Exception, too, may be taken to the statement that a piquant salad wepts the appetite for wine. I had always imagined that a salad, and indeed anything with vinegar in its composition, rather spoilt the human palate for wine than otherwise. And what sort of baked meats are usually served with dessert? How the poor live? An esteemed friend who has seen better days sends word how to dine a man, his wife, and three children for seven and a half pence. He heads his letter, The Kent Road Cookery. A stew is prepared with the following ingredients. One pound bullock's cheek, three and a half pence, a half pint white beans, one penny, a half pint lentils, one penny, pot herbs, one penny, two pounds potatoes, one penny, total seven and a half pence. When he has friends, the banquet is more expensive. One pound bullock's cheek, three and a half pence, one half pound cow heel, two and a half pence, one half pound leg of beef, three pence, one pint white beans, two pence, one half pint lentils, one penny, pot herbs, one penny, five pounds potatoes, two pence, total one shilling, three pence. As we never know what may happen, the above menus may come in useful. Dr. Nansen's banquet on the ice floe to celebrate his failure to discover the pole was simple enough at all events. But it would hardly commend itself to the Fendiciacal Johnny. There was raw gull in it, by way of a full-flavored combination of poisson and entree. There was meat chocolate in it, and pelly, I should say, pemmican. There were pancakes made of oatmeal and dog's blood, fried in seal's blubber, and I rather fancy the relevé was chin on nature. For in his most interesting work across Greenland, Dr. Nansen has inserted the statement that the man who turns his nose up at raw dog for dinner is unfit for an Arctic expedition. For my own poor part, I would take my chance with a porterhouse steak, cut from a polar bear. Prison fare. Another simple meal. Any visitor to one of Her Majesty's penitentiaries may have noticed in the cells a statement to the effect that beans and bacon may be substituted for meat for the convict's dinners on certain days. Beans and bacon sounds rural, if not absolutely bucolic. Fancy giving such good food to the wretches, once exclaimed a lady visitor. But those who have sampled the said beans and bacon say that it is hardly to be preferred to the six ounces of Australian dingo, or the coarse suet duff, plumless, which furnish the ordinary prison dinner. For the tablespoon of pappy beans with which the captive staves off starvation are of the genius Herricot, and the parallelogram of salted hog's flesh which accompanies the beans does not exceed in size the ordinary railway ticket. End of section 9 Recording by Philip Gould Section 10 of Cakes and Ale This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Thomas Peter Cakes and Ale by Edward Spencer Section 10 Vegetables Herbs and other country messes, which the neat-handed Phyllis dresses. Item. The potato, earth apple, murphy, or spud. The most useful, as well as the most exasperating gift of a bountiful providence. Those inclined to obesity may skip the greater part of this chapter. You can employ a potato for almost anything. It comes in very handy for the manufacture of starch, sugar, Irish stew, Scotch whiskey, and Colorado beetles. Cut it in half, and with one half you restore an old master, and with the other drive the cat from the back garden. More deadly battles have been waged over the proper way to cook a potato than over a parish boundary or an Irish eviction. Strong-headed men hurl the spud high in air and receive and fracture it on their frontal bones whilst a juggler like Paul Singvali can do what he likes with it. Worn inside the pocket, it is an infallible cure for conic rheumatism, fits, and tubercular meningitis. Worn inside the body, it will convert a living skeleton into a Daniel Lambert. Plant potatoes in a game district, 
and if they come up, you will find that after the halms have withered, you can capture all your rich neighbor's pheasants, and half the partridges in the country. A nicely baked potato, deftly placed beneath the root of his tail, will make the worst gibber in the world travel, whilst, when combined with buttermilk and a modicum of meal, the earth apple has been known to nourish millions of the rising generation and to give them sufficient strength and courage to owe their back rents, and accuracy of aim for exterminating the brutal owner of the soil. The waiter, bless ye, the harmless flat-footed waiter, doesn't know all this. Potato stim are simply twopence or threepence in the little account, according to whether they be biled, mash, or soty, and if questioned as to the natural history of the flowery tuber, he would probably assume an air of injured innocence, and assure you that during his reign of thirty-five year man and boy that establishment had never had no complaints the potato is most eccentric in disposition and its cultivator should know by heart the beautiful ode of horace which commences equam memento ribus in arduis the experiences of the writer as a potato grower have been somewhat mixed and occasionally like the following set your snowflakes in deeply trenched heavily manured ground a foot apart in due time you will get a really fine crop of groundsel, charlock, and slugs, with enough bindweed to strangle the sea serpent. Clear all this rubbish off, and after a week or two the eye will be gladdened with the sight of the delicate green leaf of the tuber peeping through the soil. Slow music. Enter the Earl of Frost. No, they will not all be cut off. You will get one tuber. Peel it carefully and place it in the pigsty. The peeling spoils the quality of the pork. Throw the peeling away, on the bed in which you have sown annuals for choice, and in the late spring you will have a row of potatoes which will do you credit. But this is frivolous. The origin of the potato is doubtful, but that it was used by the ancients in warfare is tolerably certain. Long before the Spaniards reached the New World, it was cultivated largely by the Incas, and it was the Spaniards who brought the tuber to Europe in the beginning of the sixteenth century. It was brought to England from Virginia by Sir John Hawkins in 1563, and again in 1586 by Sir Francis Drake, to whom, as the introducer of the potato, a statue was erected at Offenburg in Baden in 1853. In schools and other haunts of ignorance, the credit for the introduction of the tuber used to be, and is, I believe, still given to Sir Walter Raleigh, who has been wrongly accredited with as many good things as have been Theodore Hook or Sidney Smith. And I may mention, en parenthèse, that I don't entirely believe that cloak story. For many years the tuber was known in England as the Batata, overhaul your Lorna Doon, and in France, until the close of the eighteenth century, the earth apple was looked upon with suspicion as the cause of leprosy and assorted fevers, just as the tomato at the close of the more civilized nineteenth century, is said by the vulgar and swine-headed to breed cancer. Now then, with or without the jacket? And the reader who imagines that I am going to answer the question has too much imagination. As the old butler in Wilkie Collins' The Moonstone observes, there is much to be said on both sides. Personally, I lean to the no-jacket side, unless the two were be baked, and I would make it penal to serve a potato in any other way than boiled, steamed, or baked. Footnote. Kidney potatoes should always be boiled, as steaming makes them more waxy. End of footnote. The bad fairy Ayla should have no hand in its manipulation, and there be few aesthetic eaters who would not prefer the old-fashioned ball of flour to slices of the sodden article swimming in a bath of grease and parsley and called a sauté. The horrible concoction, eclept, preserved potatoes, which used to be served out aboard sailing vessels, after the passengers had eaten all the real articles, and which tasted like bad peas pudding dressed with furniture polish, is happily deceased. And the best potatoes, the same breed which our fathers and our forefathers munched in the Covent Garden Cave of Harmony, grow, I am credibly informed, in German Street. Moreover, if you wish to spoil a dish of good spuds, there is no surer way than by leaving on the dish cover. So much for boiling em, or steaming em. 
the cabbage is a fine friendly fellow who makes himself at home and generally useful in the garden whilst his great heart swells and swells in the full knowledge that he is doing his level best to please all though cut down in the springtime of his youth his benevolence is so great that he will sprout again from his headless trunk if required and given time for reflection the romans introduced him into great britain but there was a sort of cow cabbage in the island before that time which our blue forefathers used to devour with their bacon and steaks in a raw state the most evolved and final variety of the cabbage writes a savant is the cauliflower in which the vegetative surplus becomes poured into the flowering head of which the flowering is more or less checked the inflorescence becoming a dense corum instead of an open panicle and the majority of the flowers aborting the head gardener usually tells you all this in the scottish language as to become incapable of producing seed let especially vegetative cabbage repeat the excessive development of its leaf parenchyma and we have the wrinkled and blistered savoy of which the hardy constitution but comparative coarseness becomes also more intelligible again especially vegetative cauliflower gives us an easily grown and hardy winter variety broccoli brochilo in costarese from which and not from the ordinary cauliflower a sprouting variety arises in turn in jersey the cabbage stalks are dried varnished and used as spars for thatched roofs as also for the correction of the youthful population cook all varieties of the cabbage in water already at the boil with a little salt and soda in it the french sprinkle cheese on a cauliflower to make it more tasty and it then becomes choufleur au gratin remove the green leaves and underboil your cauliflower pour over it some butter sauce in which have been mixed two ounces of grated cheese half gruyere and half parmesan powder with bread crumbs or raspings and with more grated cheese lastly pour over it a teaspoonful of oiled butter place in a hot oven and bake till the surface is a golden brown which should be in from ten to fifteen minutes serve in same dish vegetarians should be particularly careful to soak every description of cabbage in salt and water before cooking otherwise the vegetarians will probably eat a considerable portion of animal food here occurs an opportunity for the recipe for an elegant dish which the french call perdri au chou which is simply partridge stewed with cabbage etc a brace of birds browned in a stew pan with butter or good dripping and a portion of a hand of pickled pork in small pieces some chopped onion and a clove or two add some broth two carrots chopped a bay leaf and a chopped sausage or two then add a savoy cabbage cut into quarters and seasoned with pepper and salt let all simmer together for an hour and a half then drain the cabbage and place it squashed down on a dish arrange the birds in the middle surround them with the pieces of pork and sausage and pour over all the liquor from the stew this is an excellent dish and savors more of teutonic than of french cooking but you mustn't tell a frenchman this if he be bigger than yourself the toothsome pea has been cultivated in the east from time immemorial though the ancient greeks and romans do not appear to have had knowledge of such a dainty had vitellius known the virtues of duck and green peas he would probably have not been so wrapped up in his favorite dormice stuffed with poppy seed and stewed in honey the ancient Egyptians knew all about the little pulse. Not one of the leaders of society was mummified without a pod or two being placed amongst his wrappings. And after thousands of years, said peas, when sown, have been known to germinate. The mummy pea plant, however, but seldom bears fruit. Our idiotic ancestors, the ancient Britons, knew nothing about peas, nor do any of their descendants appear to have troubled about the vegetable before the reign of the Virgin Queen then they were imported from holland together with schnapps kurakawa and other things and no swagger banquet was held without a dish of fresh shelled uns which was accounted fit dainties for ladies they came so far and cost so dear in england up-to-date peas are frequently accompanied by pigeon pie at table the dove family being especially partial to the little pulse either when attached to the home in the garden or in a dried state so that the crafty husbandman who possesses a shotgun frequently gathereth both pea and pigeon 
a chalky soil is especially favourable to pea cultivation, and deal sawdust sprinkled well over the rows immediately after the setting of the seed will frustrate the knavish tricks of the field mouse, who also likes peas. The man who discovered the affinity between mint and this vegetable ought to have received a gold medal, and I would gladly attend the execution of the caitiff who invented the tin peas which we get at the foreign restaurants at three times the price of the English article. Here is a good simple recipe for pea soup, made from the dried article. Soak a quart of split peas in rain water for twelve hours. Put them in the pot with one carrot, one onion, one leek, a sprig or two of parsley, all chopped, one pound of streaky bacon, and three quarts of the liquor in which either beef, mutton, pork, or poultry may have been boiled. Boil for nearly three hours, remove the bacon, and strain the soup through a tammy. Heat up, and serve with dried mint, and small cubes of fat bacon fried crisp. Green pea soup is made in precisely the same way, but the peas will not need soaking beforehand and thrifty housewives put in the shells as well. Harmless and nutritious a vegetable as the bean would appear to be, it did not altogether find favour with the ancients. Pythagoras, who had quaint ideas on the subject of the human soul, forbade his disciples to eat beans, because they were generated in the foul ooze out of which man was created. Lucian, who had a vivid imagination, describes a philosopher in Hades who was particularly hard on the bean, to eat which he declared was as great a crime as to eat one's father's head. And yet Lucian was accounted a man of common sense in his time. The Romans only ate beans at funerals, being under the idea that the souls of the dead abode in the vegetable. According to tradition, the Colla Heron, hawked in the streets of Edinburgh, were once known as Lives of Men, from the risks run by the fishermen. And the Romans introduced the bean into England by way of cheering up our blue forefathers. In the Roman festival of Lemuralia, the father of the family was accustomed to throw black beans over his head, whilst repeating an incantation. This ceremony probably inspired Lucian's philosopher, for whom, however, every allowance should be made when we come to consider his place of residence, with his jaundiced views of the Faba vulgaris. Curiously enough, amongst the vulgar folk, at the present day, there would seem to be some sort of prejudice against the vegetable. Or why should I'll give him beans be a synonymous threat with I'll do him all the mischief I can? There is plenty of nourishment in a bean. That is the opinion of the entire medical faculty. And whilst beans and bacon make a favourite summer repast for the farm labourer and his family, the dishes also, at the commencement of the bean season, to be met with at the tables of the wealthy. The aroma of the flower of the broad bean was once compared, in one of John Leach's studies in Punch, to the most delicious air oil, but apart from this fragrance, there is but little sentiment about the Faba vulgaris. A much more graceful vegetable is the Fasciolus vulgaris, the kidney, or as the idiotic French call it, the haricot bean. It is just as sensible to call a leg of Welsh mutton a pré salé or salt meadow. No well-behaved hashed venison introduces himself to our notice unless accompanied by a dish of kidney beans. And few people in Europe besides Frenchmen and convicts eat the dried seeds of this form of bean, which is frequently sown in suburban gardens to form a fence to keep out cats. But the suburban cat knows a trick worth a dozen of that one and no bean that was ever born will arrest his progress, or turn him from his evil ways. It is criminal to smother the kidney bean with melted butter at table. A little oil, vinegar, and pepper agree with him much better. In the great continent of America, the kidney bean seed, dried, is freely partaken of. Pork and Boorstin beans, in fact, form the national dish, and right good it is, but do not attempt any violent exercise after eating the same. The Mexicans are the largest bean-eaters in the world. They fry the vegetables in oil or stew them with peppers and onions, and these frioles form the principal sustenance of the lower orders. An English bean-feast, vulg bino, is a feast at which no beans and not many other things are eaten. The intelligent foreigner may take it that bino simply means the worship of Bacchus. 
with the exception of the onion there is no more useful aid to cookery of all sorts than the lowly carrot which was introduced into england no not by the romans from holland in the sixteenth century and the ladies who attended the court of charles i were in the habit of wearing carrot leaves in the hair and on their court robes instead of feathers a similar fashion might be revived at the present epoch with advantage to the banking account of vile man as the flemish gardeners brought over the roots we should not despise carrots cooked in the flemish way simmer some young carrots in butter with pepper and salt add cream or milk and yolk of eggs a pinch of sugar and a little chopped parsley his royal highness the prince of wales according to report invariably eats carrot soup on the twenty sixth of august the french call it crazy soup because their best carrots grow there and crazy it may be remembered was also the scene of a great battle when one englishman proved better than five frenchmen in this battle the black prince performed prodigies of valor afterwards assuming the crest of the late bohemian king three ostrich feathers surely these should be carrot tops with the motto ik diem crazy soup place a mirepoix of white wine in the pot and put a quantity of sliced carrots atop moisten with broth and keep simmering till the carrots are done then pour into a mortar pound and pass through a tammy thin it with more broth sweeten in the proportion of one tablespoonful of sugar to two gallons of soup heat up pop a little butter in at the finish and in serving it add either small cubes of fried bread or rice boiled as for curry see page one hundred and forty five end of section ten section eleven of cakes and ale this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Thomas Peter. Cakes and Ale by Edward Spencer. Section 11. Vegetables Continued. Earth's simple fruits. We all enjoy them. Then why with sauces rich alloy them? it is one of the most exasperating laws and ordinations of nature that the nicest things shall last the shortest time whom the gods love die young is an ancient proverb and the produce of the garden which is most agreeable to man invariably gives out too soon look at peas every gardener of worth puts in the seed so that you may get the different rows of marrow fats and telephones and niplet ultra in succession and up they all come at one and the same time whilst if you fail to pick them all at once the combined efforts of mildew on the sun will soon save you the labour of picking them at all look at strawberries and why can't they stay in our midst all the year round like the various members of the cabbage family then look at asparagus the gardener who could persuade the heads of this department to pop up in succession from january to december would earn more money than the prime minister the favoured vegetable of the ancient Romans was introduced by them, with their accustomed unselfishness, into Britain, where it has since flourished, more particularly in the alluvial soil of the Thames Valley in the neighbourhood of Mortlake and Richmond, ground which is also especially favourable to the growth of celery. In an ancient work called De Re Rustica, Cato the Elder, who was born 234 BC, has much to say far more indeed than i can translate without the aid of a dictionary or crib about the virtues and proper cultivation of asparagus and pliny another noble roman devotes several chapters of his natural history published at the commencement of the christian era to the same subject of all the productions of your garden says this mr pliny your chief care will be your asparagus and the cheerful and sanguine householder of today who sows his asparagus and expects to get it while he waits is ample consolation for disappointment in the reflection that his labours will benefit posterity if not the next tenant the foreigners can beat us for size in the matter of asparagus but ours is a long way in front for flavour in france the vegetable is very largely grown at argenteuil in the seine 
a district which has also produced and still produces a wine which is almost as dangerous to man as hydrocyanic acid and which was invariably served in the restaurants after the sitting had been a lengthy one no matter what special brand might have been ordered english hosts play the same game with their military ports and inferior sherries the argentoy asparagus is now grown between the vines at least a thousand acres are in cultivation hence the peculiar flavour which however grateful it may be to frenchmen is somewhat sickly and not to be compared with that of the little gentleman in green nearly the whole of whom we english can consume with safety to digestion according to greek mythology asparagus grew on the elysian fields but whether the blessed took oil and vinegar with it or the bill stickers paste so favoured in middle-class kitchens of to-day there is no record it goes best however with a plain salad dressing a spot of mustard worked into a tablespoonful of oil and a dessert spoonful of tarragon vinegar with pepper and salt ad lib asparagus is no longer known in the british pharmacopoeia but the french make large medicinal use of its root which is supposed to still the action of the heart like foxglove and to act as a preventive of calculi in cooking the vegetable tie in small bundles which should be stood on end in the saucepan so that the delicate heads should be steamed and not touched by the boiling water many cooks will contest this point which however does not admit of argument there was once discussion in a well-known hostelry as to whether the tomato was a fruit or a vegetable eventually the head waiter was invited to solve the great question he did so on the spot to martyr sir to martyr sir hextra and as a hextra it has never since that period ceased to be regarded a native of south america the plant was introduced into europe by the spaniards late in the sixteenth century and the english got it in fifteen ninety six still until a quarter of a century ago the tomato has not been largely cultivated save by the market gardener in fact in private gardens it was conspicuous by its absence those who eat it do not invariably succumb to cancer and the dyspeptic should always keep it on the premises as the tomato is also known as the love apple a great point was missed by our old friend sergeant Roosevelt in the celebrated bardell vs pickwick trial when referring to the postscript chops and tomato sauce possibly charles dickens was not an authority on vegetable i beg pardon hextras here is a french recipe for tomate au gratin cut open the tops and scoop out the pulp pass it through a sieve to clear away the pips and mix with it either a modicum of butter or oil some chopped shallot and garlic with pepper and salt simmer the mixture for a quarter of an hour then stir in some bread crumbs previously soaked in broth and some yolks of egg when cold fill the tomato skins with the mixture shake some fine bread raspings over each and bake in quick oven for ten or twelve minutes the turnip is not as might be sometimes imagined entirely composed of compressed deal splinters but is a vegetable which was cultivated in india long before the britons got it the scotch call turnips neeps but the scotch will do anything probably no member of the vegetable family is so great a favorite with the insect pests sent on earth by an all-wise providence to prevent mankind having too much to eat but see that you get a few turnips to cook when there is a roast duck for dinner spinach was introduced into spain by the arabs and as neither nation possessed at that time at all events the attribute of extra cleanliness they must have eaten a great deal of matter in the wrong place otherwise known as dirt for if ever there was a vegetable the preparation of which for table would justify any cook in giving notice to leave it is spinach the germans have nicknamed it stomach brush and there is no plant growing which conduces more to the health of man but there has been more trouble over the proper way to serve it at table than over armenia the french chop up their epinal and mix butter or gravy with the mess many english on the other hand prefer the leaves cooked whole it is all a matter of taste but i seem to send a soft sweet fragrance in the air a homely and health-giving reek which warns me that i have too long neglected to touch upon the many virtues of the onion indigenous to india in the form of garlic 
or gar leek the original onion the egyptians got hold of the tear provoker and cultivated it two thousand years before the christian era so that few of the mortals of whom we have ever read can have been ignorant of the uses of the onion or gar leek but knowledge and practice have enabled modern gardeners to produce larger bulbs than even the most imaginative of the ancients can have dreamt of to mention all the uses to which the onion is put in the kitchen would be to write a book too weighty for any known motive power to convey to the british museum but it may be briefly observed of the juice of the sepa that it is invaluable for almost any purpose from flavoring a dish fit to set before a king to the alleviation of the inflammation caused by the poison bearing needle which the restless wasp keeps for use within his or her tail in fact the inhabited portion of the globe had better be without noses than without onions like the tomato celery is a hextra and a very important one if you buy the heads at half a crown per hundred and sell them at threepence a portion it will not exercise your calculating powers to discover the profits which can be made out of this simple root celery is simply cultivated smallage a weed which has existed in britain since the age of ice it was the Italians who made the discovery that educated smallage would become celery, and it is worthy of note that their forefathers, the conquerors of the world, with the Greeks, seem to have known no touch of it, as a relish at all events, though some writers will have it that the apium, with which the victors at the Isthmian and other games were crowned, was not parsley, but the leaf of the celery plant. But what does it matter? Celery is invaluable as a flavour and when properly cultivated and not stringy a most delightful and satisfactory substance to bite in fact a pretty woman never shows to more advantage than when nibbling a crisp short head of celery provided she possesses pretty teeth with boiled turkey or ditto pheasant celery sauce is de rigueur and it should be flavoured slightly with slices of onion an ounce of butter being allowed to every head of celery the french are fond of it stewed and as long as the flavour of the gravy or jus does not disguise the flavour of the celery it is excellent when thus treated its merits in a salad will be touched upon in another chapter the parsnip is a native of england where it is chiefly used to make an inferior kind of spirit or a dreadful brand of wine otherwise few people would trouble to cultivate the parsnip for we can't be having boiled pork or salt fish for dinner every day the vegetable marrow is a member of the pumpkin family and is a comparatively tasteless occupant of the garden its appearance in which heralds the departure of summer in the suburbs if you want to annoy the people next door you cannot do better than put in a marrow plant or two if they come to anything and get plenty of water they will crawl all over your neighbor's premises and unless he is fond of the breed and cuts and cooks them they make him mad the frugal housewife blessed with a large family, makes jam of the surplus marrows. But I prefer conserve of apricot, gooseberry, or green gauge. Another purpose to which to put this vegetable is, scoop out the seeds, after cutting it in half, lengthways. Fill the space with minced veal, cooked, small cubes of bacon, and plenty of seasoning. Some people add the yolk of an egg. Put on the other half marrow and bake for half an hour. This baked marrow is a cheap and homely dish which, like many another savoury dish, seldom finds its way to the rich man's dining room. The artichoke is a species of thistle, and the man who pays the usual high-toned restaurant prices for the pleasure of eating such insipid food is an... <laughs> never mind what. Boil the thing in salt and water, and dip the ends of the leaves in oil and vinegar, or holland sauce, before eating. Then you will enjoy the really fine flavour of the oil and vinegar or holland sauce the so-called jerusalem artichoke is really a species of sunflower its tuber is not a universal favorite though it possesses far from a coarse flavor the plant has nothing whatever to do with jerusalem and never had put a tuber or two into your garden and you will have jerusalem artichokes as long as you live on these premises for the vegetable will stay with you as long as the gout or the rate gatherer pheasants are particularly partial to this sort of crop by far the best vegetable production of the gorgeous east is the brinjal it is oval in shape and about the size of a hen's egg the surface being purple in colour 
it is usually cut in twain and done on the grating. I have met something very like the brinjal in Covent Garden, but can find no record of the vegetable's pedigree in any book. Although there are still many vegetarian restaurants in our large towns, the prejudice against animal food is, happily, dying out, and if ridicule could kill, we should not hear much more of the cranks, who with delightful inconsistency would spurn a collop of beef and gorge themselves on milk in every shape and form. If milk, butter, and cheese be not animal food, I should like to know what is. And it is as reasonable to ask a man to sustain life on dried peas and mushrooms as to feed a tiger on cabbages. Once, and only once, has the writer attempted a vegetarian banquet. It was savoury enough, and possessed the additional merit of being cheap. Decidedly filling at the price was that meal. We, I had a messmate, commenced with alleged Scotch broth, which consisted principally of dried peas, pearl barley, and oatmeal and a large slice of really excellent brown bread was served to each with this broth. Thereupon followed a savoury stew of onions and tomatoes, relieved by a savoury pie, apparently made from potatoes, leeks, breadcrumbs, butter, and postponed mushrooms. We had gone straight up to now, but both shied a bit at the macaroni and grated cheese. We had two bottles of ginger beer apiece for this dinner, which cost less than three shillings for the two, after the dapper little waitress had been feed. On leaving, we both agreed to visit that cleanly and well-ordered little house again, if only from motives of economy. But within half an hour that program was changed. Like the old lady at the tea-drinking, I commenced to swell visibly, and so did my companion. "'Mod alive!' he gasped. "'I feel just for all the world like a captive balloon, or a puffy dunter. That's a puffing whale, you kin. I'll visit your onion house nae mair in my life. And I think it costs us something like half a sovereign in old brandy to neutralize the effects of that vegetarian banquet. End of section 11《All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. • Recording by Thomas Peter • Cakes and Ale by Edward Spencer • Section 12 Curries Thou comest in such a questionable shape that I will speak to thee. The poor Indian grinds his coriander seeds, green ginger, and other ingredients between two large flat stones, taking a whiff at the family hubble-bubble pipe at intervals. The frugal British housewife purchases, alleged, curry powder in the warehouse of Italy, where it may have lived on, like Claudian, through the centuries, stirs a spoonful or two into the hashed mutton, surrounds it with a wall of clammy rice, and calls it Benares curry made from the recipe of a very dear uncle who met his death while tiger-shooting. And you will be in the minority if you do not cut this savoury meat with a knife, and eat potatoes, and very often cabbage, with it. The far-seeing eating-housekeeper corrals that lascar, or discharged mitar into the firm, gives him his board, a pound a month, and a clean pugari and kumabun daily and stars him in the bill as an Indian chef, fresh from the Charingi Club, Calcutta. And it is part of the duties of this Oriental, supposed by the unwary to be at least a prince in his native land, to hand the portions of curry, which he may or may not have concocted, to the appreciative guests, who enjoy their repast all the more from having the scent of the hoogly brought across the footlights. I was once sadly and solemnly reproved by the head waiter of a very swagger establishment, indeed for sending away, after one little taste, the alleged curry, which had been handed me by an exile from Ind, in snow-white raiment. "'You really ought to have eaten that, sir,' said the waiter, "'for that man's family have been celebrated curry-makers for generations.' I small abroad smile. 
in the land of the moguls the very babies who roll in the dust know the secret of curry making but that that man had had any hand in the horrible concoction placed before me i still resolutely declined to believe and how can a man be cook and waiter at the same time the native curry maker depend on it is more or less of a fraud and his aid is only invoked as an excuse for overcharging at the oriental club are served or used to be served really excellent curries assorted for as there be more ways than one of killing a cat so are there more curries than one the french turn out a horrible mixture with parsley and mushrooms in it which they call curry it is called by a still worse name on the boulevards and the children of our lively neighbors are frequently threatened with it by their nurses on the whole the east indian method is the best and the most philanthropic curry i ever tasted was one which my own kitmugar had just prepared with infinite pains for his own consumption the poor heathen had prospected a feast as it was one of his numerous big days so despising the homely doll on the which with a plate of rice and a modicum of rancid butter he was wont to sustain existence he had manufactured a savoury mess of pottage the looks of which gratified me so at the risk of starting another mutiny it was ordained that the slave should serve the refection at the table of the protector of the poor and a puka curry it was too another dish of native manufacture with which the writer became acquainted was a parsi curry the eminent firm of jahangir on one occasion presented a petition to the commanding officer that they might be allowed to supply a special curry to the mess one guest night the request was probably made as an inducement to some of the young officers to pay a little on account of their ownings to the firm but it is to be feared that no special vote of thanks followed the sampling of that special curry it was a curry i tasted it for a week as the frenchman did the soup of swindon and the parsi chef must have upset the entire contents of the spice box into it i never felt more like murder than when the hotel cook in manchester put nutmeg in the oyster sauce but after that curry the strangling of the entire firm of jahangir would in our cantons at all events have been brought in justifiable homicide oyster sauce recalls a quaint simile i once heard a bookmaker make use of he was talking of one of his aristocratic debtors whom he described as sure to pay up if you could only get hold of him but mark you continued the layer of odds he's just about as easy to get hold of as the oyster and the sauce at one of our municipal banquets but return we to our coriander seeds there is absolutely no reason why the frugal housewife in this country should not make her own curry powder from day to day as it may be required here is an average indian recipe but it must be remembered that in the gorgeous east tastes vary as much as elsewhere and that bengal bombay madras including burma ceylon and the strait settlements have all different methods of preparing a curry a few coriander and cumin seeds according to taste eight peppercorns a small piece of turmeric and one dried chili all pounded together when making the curry mixture take a piece of the heart of a cabbage the size of a hen's egg chop it fine and add one sour apple in thin slices the size of a keswick codlin the juice of a medium-sized lemon a salt spoonful of black pepper and a tablespoonful of the above curry powder mix all well together then take six medium-sized onions which have been chopped small and fried a delicate brown a clove of garlic also chopped small two ounces of fresh butter two ounces of flour and one pint of beef gravy boil up this lot which commences with the onions and when boiling stir in the rest of the mixture let it all simmer down and then add the solid part of the curry i e the meat cut in portions not larger than two inches square remember o frugal housewife that the turmeric portion of the entertainment should be added with a niggard hand too much turmeric is the fault which is found with most curries made in england i remember when a boy 
that there was an idea rooted in my mind that curries were made with dr gregory's powder an unsavoury drug with which we were periodically regaled by the head nurse and there was always a fierce conflict at the dinner-table when the bill of fare included this as we supposed physical terror but it was simply the taste of turmeric to which we took exception what is turmeric a plant in cultivation all over india whose tubers yield a deep yellow powder of a resinous nature this resinous powder is sold in lumps and is largely used for adulterating mustard just as inferior anchovy sauce is principally composed of armenian bowl the deep red powder with which the actor makes up his countenance turmeric is also used medicinally in hindustan but not this side of suez although in chemistry it affords an infallible test for the presence of alkalis the coriander has become naturalized in parts of england but is more used on the continent our confectioners put the seeds in cakes and buns also comfits and in germany norway sweden and i fancy russia they figure in household bread in the south of england coriander and caraway seeds are sown side by side and crops of each are obtained in alternate years the coriander seed too is largely used with that of the caraway and the cumin for making the liqueur known as cumel cumin is mentioned in scripture as something particularly nice the seeds are sweet savoured something like those of the caraway but more potent in germany they put them into bread and the dutch use them to flavour their cheeses the seeds we get in england come principally from sicily and malta and now that my readers know all about the ingredients of curry powder it is assumed that no analysis of the chili the ginger root or the peppercorn is needed let them emulate the pupils of mr wackford squeers and go and do it another recipe for curry powder includes fenugreek cardamoms allspice and cloves and i verily believe that this was the powder used in that abominable parsi hell broth above alluded to so it should be cautiously approached if at all fenugreek sounds evil and i should say a curry compounded of the above ingredients would taste like a number one pick-me-up yet another recipe dr kitchener's specifies six ounces of coriander seed five ounces of turmeric or mukul i'm of opinion two ounces each of black pepper and mustard seed Hon. half an ounce of cumin seed half an ounce of cinnamon donhurun blintzen and one ounce of lesser cardamoms all these things are to be placed in a cool oven kept there in one night and pounded in a marble mortar next morning preparatory to being rubbed through a sieve kitchener sounds like a good cooking name but with all due respect i am not going to recommend his curry powder a malay curry is made with blanched almonds which should be fried in butter till lightly browned then pound them to a paste with a sliced onion and some thin lemon rind curry powder and gravy are added and a small quantity of cream the malays curry all sorts of fish flesh and fowl including the young shoots of the bamboo and nice tender succulent morsels they are at a hotel overlooking the harbour of point de gal ceylon run at the time of the writer's visit by a most convivial and enterprising yankee a canning concoct of all sorts of slings and cocktails there used to be quite a plethora of curries in the bill of fare but for a prawn curry there is no place like the city of palaces and the reason for this super excellence is that the prawns <laughs> but that story had perhaps best remain untold curried locusts formed one of the most eccentric dishes ever tasted by the writer there had come upon us that day a plague of these all-devouring insects a few billions called on us in our kitchen gardens in passing and whilst they ate up every green thing including the newly painted wheelbarrow and the regimental standard which had been incautiously left out of doors our faithful blacks managed to capture several impis of the marauding scuts in revenge and the mess cook made a right savoury plot of their hindquarters it is criminal to serve curry during the entree period of dinner and it is worse form still to hand it round after gooseberry tart and cream and trifle as i have seen done at one great house in the land of its birth the spicy pottage invariably precedes the sweets nubby box marches solemnly round with the mixture in a deep dish and is succeeded by ram lal with the rice 
and in the madras presidency where dry curry is served as well as the other brand there is a procession of three brown attendants highly seasoned dishes at the commencement of a long meal are a mistake and this is one of the reasons why i prefer the middle cut of a plain boiled tay salmon or the tit-bit of a lordly turbot or a flake or two of a grimsby cod to a sole normandy or a red mullet stewed with garlic mushrooms and inferior claret i have even met omar à l'américain during the fish course at the special request of a well-known duke the soup too eaten at a large dinner should be as plain as possible the edge being fairly taken off the appetite by such concoctions as bisque bouillabaisse and mulligatawny all savoury and tasty dishes but each a meal in itself then i maintain that to curry white bait is wrong partly because curry should on no account be served before roast and boiled and partly because the flavour of the white bait is too delicate for the fish to be clad in spices and onions the lesson which all dinner givers ought to have learned from the ancient romans the first people on record who went in for aesthetic cookery is that highly seasoned and well peppered dishes should figure at the end and not the commencement of a banquet here follows a list of some of the productions of nature which it is allowable to curry what to curry turbot sole cod lobster crayfish prawns but not the so-called dublin prawn which is delicious when heated and plain boiled but no good in a curry whelks oysters scallops mutton veal pork calf's head ox palate tripe eggs chicken rabbit the bunny lends itself better than anything else to this method of cooking peas kidney beans vegetable marrow carrots parsnips bamboo shoots locust legs a mistaken notion has prevailed for some time amongst men and women who write books that the indian curry mixture is almost red-hot to the taste as a matter of fact it is of a far milder nature than many i have tasted on the side also the anglo-indian does not sustain life entirely on food flavoured with turmeric and garlic in fact during a stay of seven years in the gorgeous east the writer's experience was that not one in ten touched curry at the dinner table at second breakfast otherwise known as tiffin it was a favoured dish but the stuff prepared for the meal of the day or the bulk thereof usually went to gratify the voracious appetite of the metos the hindus who swept out the mess-rooms and whose lowness of caste allowed them to eat anything an eccentric meal was the metos dinner into the empty preserved meat tin which she brought round to the back door I have seen emptied such assorted pablum as mock turtle soup, lobster salad, plum pudding and custard, curry, and, uh, of course, the surplus villo leaf. And in a few seconds he was squatting on his heels and spading into the mixture with both hands. In the Bengal presidency, coconut is frequently used for the curry dressing, and as some men have as great a horror of the sedition as of oil in a salad, it is as well to consult the tastes of your guests beforehand a prawn curry i have seen made in calcutta as follows the proportions of spices etc being specially written down by a munshi pound and mix one tablespoonful of coriander seed one tablespoonful of poppy seed a saltspoonful of turmeric half a saltspoonful of cumin seed a pinch of ground cinnamon a ditto of ground nutmeg a small lump of ginger and one saltspoonful of salt mix this with butter add two sliced onions and fry to lightly browned add the prawns shelled and pour in the milk of a coconut simmer for twenty minutes and add some lime juice but the champion of curries ever sampled by the writer was a dry curry a decided improvement on those usually served in the madras presidency and the recipe which has been already published in the sporting times and ladies pictorial only came into the writer's possession some years after he had quitted the land of temples dry curry one pound of meat mutton fowl or whitefish one pound of onions one clove of garlic two ounces of butter one dessert spoonful of curry powder one dessert spoonful of curry paste one dessert spoonful of chutney or tamarind preserve according to taste a very little cassareep which is a condiment only obtainable at a few london shops made from the juice of the bitter cassava or manioc root 
Casserape is the basis of that favorite West Indian dish, pepper pot. Salt to taste. A good squeeze of lemon juice. First brown the onions in the butter, and then dry them. Add the garlic, which must be mashed to a pulp with the blade of a knife. Then mix the powder, paste, chutney, and cassarepe into a thin paste with the lemon juice. Mash the dried onions into this, and let all cook gently till thoroughly mixed. Then add the meat, cut into small cubes, and let all simmer very gently for three hours. This sounds a long time, but it must be remembered that the recipe is for a dry curry, and when served there should be no liquid about it. "'Tis a troublesome dish to prepare, but judging from the flattering communications received by the writer, the lieges would seem to like it, and the mixture had better be cooked in a double or porridge saucepan to prevent any catching. Already in one of the breakfast chapters has the subject of the preparation of rice to be served with curry been touched upon, but there would be no harm done in giving the directions again. Rice for Curry Soak a sufficiency of rice in cold water until by repeated strainings all the dirt is separated from it. Then put the rice into boiling water, and let it gallop for nine or ten minutes. No longer. Strain the water off through a colander, and dash a little cold water over the rice to separate the grains. Put in a hot dish, and serve immediately. A simple enough recipe, surely. So let us hear no more complaints of stodgy, clammy, pudding-y rice. Most of the cookery books give far more elaborate directions, but the above is the method usually pursued by the poor brown heathen himself. Sawyer's recipe resembles the above, but after draining the water from the cooked rice, it is replaced in the saucepan, the interior of which has in the interim been anointed with butter. The saucepan is then placed either near the fire, not on it, or in a slow oven, for the rice to swell. Another way. After washing the rice, throw it into plenty of boiling water, in the proportion of six pints of water to one pound of rice. Boil it for five minutes, and skim it. Then add a wine glassful of milk for every half pound of rice, and continue boiling for five minutes longer. Strain the water off through a colander, and put it dry into the pot, on the corner of the stove, pouring over the rice a small piece of butter, which had been melted in a tablespoonful of the hot milk and water in which the rice was boiled. Add salt, and stir the rice for five minutes more. The decayed denizen of the ocean dried to the consistency of a biscuit, and known in Hindustan as a Bombay duck, which is frequently eaten with curry, over yonder, does not find much favour this side of Port Said, although I have met the fellow in certain city restaurants. The addition is not looked upon with any particular favour by the writer. I have yet to learn, once observed, that great and good man, the late Dr. Joseph Pope, to the writer, in a discussion on postponed game, that it is a good thing to put corruption to the human stomach. End of section 12